All right. Well, um, I think it's just about time to start. Um, my name is David Bennett. I'm the curator of maritime history here at the North Carolina Maritime Museum. And I want to thank um, everyone who's here um, at the museum um, for, uh, for showing up to, to listen to this talk and also everyone um, online as well. And um, uh, just want to say a quick thank you to Captain H2O who um, uh, sponsored the, uh, the live stream. So, but I've um, got a lot to cover with this particular talk. Um, the, the, this is one of the more ambitious talks I have where I'm gonna try and cover a lot of ground and actually go from the beginning and kind of bring us up to uh, where we are today with the North Carolina uh, crab fishery. So uh, first, before we really delve into the history, we're just gonna go over some very basic biology because it'll help kind of make this fishery make a little bit more sense as we go through the talk. Um, so crabs can live for about three to four years. Um, they'll reach maturity in about a year, year and a half. And uh, their, their growth and their activity is very dependent on the temperature. They like water that's at least 60 degrees Fahrenheit. If it drops below that, then they will burrow into the mud and go into hibernation, um, especially during the winter time. In order to grow larger, they have to molt or they have to shed their shells uh, multiple times throughout their lives. And in terms of what they'll eat, they'll eat just about anything from plant matter to uh, dead sea life to uh, living oysters and clams. Um, in terms of, of predators or animals that will prey upon them, um, large, larger fish, um, will prey upon them, particularly when they're in their sort of juvenile stages or soft shell crab stages um, of their life cycles, as well as some birds will also prey upon them. Um, and one of the, of course, interesting kind of cool aspects of them is that they can shed um, or sacrifice uh, their limbs and later regenerate them. Um, and so the sort of commercial area where they're, they're harvested the most is uh, south of the Delaware River. So you have Delaware River here and uh, they're harvested commercially all the way down into the Gulf of Mexico. The, the big producers have historically been uh, Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, uh, Florida, Louisiana has, have also ranked very high in terms of productivity. Uh, within North Carolina, uh, the, ma the majority of the commercial landings historically have come from uh, the waters of Carter County on northward up into the Albemarle Sound and into the Currituck Sound areas. Of course, um, Pamlico Sound being a huge area, as well as areas like the Noose River, uh, the, the Pamlico River, Pungo River, those areas have huge uh, commercial crabbing um, industries. And so um, also uh, a, a sexually mature uh, blue crab is, is referred to as a jimmy and, and the males um, are easily identified by the sort of T-shaped apron on their bellies or as the sexually mature females um, are called sooks. Um, and well, this one's more immature but it does have a triangular shaped apron on its belly and that's an easy way to, to tell the females, also the females tend to have um, more red um, on their claw, at the tips of their claws than, uh, than males do. Um, the, the females will only mate once within their lifetime and that's at their terminal molt. So the last time they'll shed their shell and they'll, they mate when they're soft um, and they'll release pheromones into the water to attract males. They'll mate, they'll, um, store the sperm within them, and then they'll migrate to high salinity waters, such as inlets uh, to spawn. Um, and so um, when the female is in her terminal malt, um, the, of course is mating with the male, the male will come and put himself over the female to sort of protect her um, while she's in her, um, in her soft stage, and also to ward off other males who might want to mate. Um, and uh, the, the, the male will go away once the, the female's shell is hard. And then this is what a, um, a female crab or a sponge crab looks like with the fertilized egg sac ready to spawn, ready to leave, release up to 8 million fertilized eggs into the water. 
And so this is the first larval stage of the blue crab, the zoea, which starts out in higher salinity waters, will move into lower salinity. And the megalops is the second larval stage. It's more in the estuarine waters. And finally, you get the sort of baby juvenile blue crab. And all the while, it's molt, this crab's molting to get bigger and bigger until it hits adult size. And it's going to molt as throughout um, its adult life. And when you have um, a crab that's getting ready to molt, they're called peelers. And there's several stages um, of of peelers, you got the, the white line peelers, and you got these little lines that will show up towards the back of their shell. You have the white line, pink line, red line. Um, those are just different stages in which they're 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 getting closer and closer and closer to ultimately being busters. And busters is where the shell is practically getting ready to come off of the uh, the um, the crab. And then finally, once it's completely malted, you have a soft shell crab, and Crabs um, are only soft for a short time. Um, and then when they start to be firm up again, they're called, they're called paper shells. Um, but I'll have a photo sequence of a buster crab um, shedding um, and becoming a soft shell. And so here it's, it's starting to sort of slip out of the shell a little bit more and then more. And then it's still coming out. And here, finally, you start to see this soft shell crab emerging from its old shell. How long did that take? Uh, oh, I'm not, I can't remember off the top of my head, sorry. Um, but it, it doesn't take too long. Um, I think hours. Yeah. So this is even more out and then almost completely out or completely out by then. Um, tends to happen in the, in the late, in, in the spring. Um, and that's the sort of big season for commercial, but they can molt throughout the, the, the warm water period. Um, but for North Carolina, the big commercial season for taking soft sh shells is more, tends is, to be in the spring. Is there another? Species soft shell crab, or is a soft shell crab these? Well, 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 crabs have to molt throughout their life cycle, but I'm, I'm mainly focusing on blue crabs because that's the, the main commercial species that's taken um, in North Carolina. Um, but anyway, so now I'm going to jump into the history. And the history is the main focus of this, and not the biology. Um, but I was just, the biology was to help illustrate some, some bits I'm going to get into. Um, but anyways, originally in the late 19th century, um, the crab industry was, was not very large at all. It was, it was a very minor industry. Um, it was more of a local market than a national, I mean, North Carolina, there was a national market and that was dominated by the Chesapeake Bay. But within North Carolina, there was a very small market and it was mostly dominated by African-American women and children who would go out at low tide and collect crabs. Um, from like tidal pools and put them in baskets and then take them to the market and sell them locally. And most of the, the local fishermen um, in North Carolina ignored crabs because uh, no one really thought of them as being commercially viable. They messed up the nets. Um, if, if there was any sort of commercial value in North Carolina in the late 19th century, it was primarily as bait or fertilizer. Um, and this is kind of what a crab caught in a net looks like. As you can tell, it'd be hard to disentangle and it would tear the nets up. Um, so it was definitely a nuisance. But first I wanna get into sort of the origin story of the soft shell crab industry in North Carolina because it's interesting. Um, it's, it's not very well documented. Um, but so the first documented individuals that I could find that really probably pioneered the soft shell crab industry in North Carolina was um, A.B. Riggin and company. Uh, you had a Bendigo Riggin and Wingate Riggin um, that were in the soft, they're, they're in the soft shell crab business and in the oyster business in uh, Crisfield, Maryland. And in the late 1890s, they moved to the Smyrna Marshallburg area of Carter County. So 
core sound communities and they went into business in soft shell crabs and oysters. And they actually expanded their oyster business throughout North Carolina. Um, but uh, a Bendigo rigging taught the locals how to, um, you know, catch the crabs and to set up um, uh, floats um, like what's illustrated here um, and allow the crabs to molt and collect uh, the soft crabs out of that, pack them in boxes with marsh grass um, where they could live for six to eight days. And when you take a crab, soft crab out of water, it takes them longer to harden back up. Um, but uh, they would be able to, to ship those off um, from Moorhead City by railroad. And so this is the, so you have Harker's Island over here. And so you've got your kind of Marshallburg, Smyrna areas over in here, uh, that part of Core Sound. And that's really where kind of the crabbing industry in North Carolina really kind of popped up. And one of the main ways people were taking crabs was with the trot line, which is simply a long line, long baited line where the crabs will go and, and grab onto the line. And then you pull the line up carefully and just scoop the crab up with a dip net. And this is actually a better illustration right here. So um, during the 19th century, they're using stakes here, they have floats, but you have a line with bait on it and the crabs are grabbing onto it. And then you have men working on a boat that are pulling the line up carefully and just collecting the crabs off. And so we do have um, documentation of people using the trot line in Bogue and Core Sounds in the 1890s. And uh, people were using lines that were anywhere from 450 to 1,000 feet long with um, bait every 18 inches. And you'd have a, a small boat that would be going along. One man would be pulling up the line, dipping up the crabs. Another man would be steering the boat. Um, and they would go out at 4 a.m. and they would work until about noon or 1 p.m. And then they would go in um, and they, off, they could catch up to eight barrels of crabs a day doing this. Um, and then we have all these images here of um, these floats where they would put the, uh, the peeler crabs or the buster crabs in there. And this is a whole system that they had in Core Sound. Of course, these photos were taken later in the 30s. And here's a man using a dip net to dip them out of a float, um, the soft crabs out, and then packing them in boxes with marsh grass. And so there were crab, Maryland crab dealers that would go into Marshallburg um, into the core sound communities in the late 1890s and the early 1900s. And they do so from March to mid-May. An example of that would be SR Sterling with one crab company from Maryland. Um, and they just go there buying up as many soft shell crabs as they could and ship them out through uh, Moorhead City. Um, there's also a couple of Moorhead City um, seafood dealers that dealt in soft shell crabs. You had Charles S. Wallace, who was the largest a uh, seafood dealer out of Moorhead at the time. He went on to be the mayor of Moorhead as well as um, he also went into uh, state um, politics as well. Um, you had uh, Captain D.B. Wade also shipped soft shell crabs from Moorhead. Um, in 1897, you had 13,600 dozen soft shell crabs shipped out of Moorhead City. By 1902, they're shipping 1,500 dozen per day. Then in 1903, it's 2,000 dozen per day. Um, it just kept growing and growing from there. And we have this, this nice quote here um, talking about the influence of, of Maryland um, on Marshallburg. It says, at Marshallburg, we began to see a good many boats with the Maryland rig with the mast leaning very far back, these being bug eyes and very funny they looked in comparison with the straight masted local craft. At Marshallburg, Maryland men were shipping soft crabs and they have built up a great business there, teaching a new and proper way to put them up. 
in dry grass, which is washed up by the water instead of in ice. Shipped in this grass, crabs will live a week and can be sent anywhere. And so this is an example of what a bug eye looks like. Um, and so they sort of have the, the canted masts. Uh, it's kind of a, maybe a little bit better illustration to see that leaning mast they're talking about. And this is a native Maryland watercraft. Um, it is actually the state boat of Maryland. It would have been unusual to see these watercraft in Core Sound. Um, maybe not quite as uncommon um, in Pamlico Sound with the crab industry, but um, they, they became um, more and more prevalent in Core Sound due to the, the Maryland influence. Um, and so, the softshell crab business grew out of Core Sound and into Bogue Sound. So Moorhead, people from Moorhead City, Broad Creek, Salter Path, Swansboro, they all got involved in softshell crab business. And it just grew and grew and grew in Carter County in the early 20th century. And another way that they caught uh, crabs um, was by using seines, small seines, that they would drag through the water to, to snag the crabs up. Um, and so here, here are some images of men doing this. And they go out with a small net skiff out into the water. And here the, the men are, they're, they have the, the net here on the ground and they're just picking the crabs out. And they're probably looking for like the peelers and the busters to put in there. Um, and also the, the crab industry is one of the few industry fisheries um, where they, they talk about women being involved in them. Um, we have this other quote here. It says, it is a real odd and right funny to see the married women and young ladies too and girls from five years old up in the water, up to their knees and waists, sometimes with their crab nets, scooping and dragging for soft crabs and peelers or busters as um, called their negligees at half mast or dresses dabbling in the water, barefooted, of course, for all go barefooted now, men, women, and all would seem curious to people not used to such. And so this is at the turn of the century where you it would have been really unusual to have seen sort of women um, in various states of undress, you know, showing a, a little bit of legs, and certainly would have been unusual to see them out working, um, doing hard days work out under the sun alongside the men in, in this sort of industry. Um, and so, as I mentioned, it, the soft shell crab got really big in Carter County and Moorhead City became the second largest soft shell crab market in the United States after Crisfield, Maryland by the early not by the first, this is within the first decade of the 20th century. Um, and of course, we have this um, Joseph Hyde Pratt, um, the state geologist, and, and oddly enough, the state geologist had authority over the commercial fishing industry in North Carolina in terms of regulation, but he wrote that very few people realize that there's any crab industry in this state for the reason that at present practically all the crabs are shipped by Crisfield, Maryland packers and usually go on the market as Maryland crabs, not as North Carolina crabs. There's an intentionally mislabeling crabs because people had this idea that crabs from the Chesapeake Bay were much finer and much more valuable and tastier. And so, uh, although there isn't really any difference between North Carolina and Chesapeake Bay blue crabs. And of course, more, the, the railroad at Moorhead City, um, which was established uh, in, in late 1850s is what made this industry really possible and able to take off. Um, the, more, the railroad enabled Carter County softshell crabs to get all the way out to Denver, Colorado. Um, he had an instance where there was a, a banquet honoring the then president, Teddy Roosevelt. Um, and part of that dinner was a whole, whole bunch of soft shell crabs from Carter County that made their way out to, to Denver. Um, also, uh, when Beaufort gained access uh, to the railroad in the first decade of the 20th century, it just further amplified the crabbing industry 
uh, especially in core sound. Um, so now I'm going to get into sort of hard crabs and and their origin story because they have it's sort of similar time period. Uh, the, the main grades of crab meat are your prime lump um, or your back thin meat, your special or flaked meat, and then you have claw meat. Um, and the first documented um, crab house in North Carolina was in Moorhead City, and it opened in 1895. It was owned by Pickett and Company of Norfolk, Virginia, and it was organized and managed by A.J. Phipps, um, who, was, who was sort of the, their agent in North Carolina operating out of Moorhead and New Bern. Um, and they had hard crabs that were being caught in Carteret County. And then they're taken to this crab house where they're boiled. Um, they're picked by hand. And then the meat was being stored in these galvanized gallon buckets and shipped uh, um, refrigerated to Norfolk where then they're then repackaged and distributed um, throughout the United States. Um, then by 1903, a crab factory was opened at Wanchies um, by George Rowley, um, who's from Hampton, Virginia, and he had larger crab factories there. Um, and he sought to primarily employ child labor, young boys to go out and catch crabs and pay them 25 cents a bushel. Um, and so that's how he sought to do business. And in the off season, he was going to process clams and oysters. Um, and he's primarily looking to go after canned clam juice. Um, and so, and after that, in the first, that first decade of the 20th century, you had more and more crab, hard crab factories opening um, on Roanoke Island, um, and then one in Belhaven. Um, and most of these factories were owned by individuals um, from uh, Maryland or Virginia, the exception being George Baker's Crab Factory at Belhaven, which was a North Carolina owned business. Um, again, as I mentioned earlier, you have um, these, th these crabs are being processed uh, locally. They're, they're steamed. Um, they're dumped in these huge re metal retorts where they're steamed at high temperatures, and then they're brought out in the women crack them open and pick them by hand. Um, African-American women traditionally have dominated the, the picking of crabs in North Carolina historically. Um, and they did at these early Manio crab factories, however, in Wanshees, um, white women and girls were employed simply because they didn't have any African-American neighborhoods nearby. Um, most of the African-American neighborhoods on Roanoke Island were out around Manio. Um, and so any additional crabs that they couldn't process, they just didn't have the capacity to process, were um, shipped up to Virginia to Norfolk and Hampton by by boats uh, for where they were processed. So they're shipping live crabs um, um, up to the Hampton Roads area. Um, in the early 1920s, the Dare County crabbers went on strike. And this might be like one of the first commercial fishing industry strikes that I've found um, in North Carolina for the, in, the, in the early 20th century. Um, I've seen like other ones in, in Southport uh, with like the shrimp industry in the 30s. But this is probably one of the earliest ones. And they went on strike simply because the price of, of um, crabs went so low that it just wasn't economical to go out and take them. Um, it started, the, the season started early in March and they're going for $3 a barrel. But by April, the price um, of crab dropped to $2 because the market had become glutted um, and the Chesapeake Bay was starting to become active. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, the crabbers, they wanted two fifty dollars a barrel in order to kind of make it worth their while. Um, then they had been catching about 15, you know, barrels a day and it was working out pretty well for them. Um, so if you start to like figure out why they're upset and start crunching the numbers, see these crabbers, they could get paid. Um, so if they're making $2 a, a, a barrel and they're catching like six barrels on a good day and they're getting taxed 25 cents per barrel and then fuel 
is anywhere from $1.50 to $3 per day. Um, and, and these are all real numbers that are coming out of this, this period for this industry. Um, on a good day where everything's going perfectly, they're making $7.50 to $9 a day. Just which just and, and that's excluding additional expenses. Like that's not ex including the cost of bait or having to repair or replace equipment or anything like that. Um, so it just really was working out financially, and that's why those guys were going on strike. Um, and it and it didn't really work out. Um, they wound up pivoting to other fisheries until the prices improved. Um, so, but why crabbing? Um, you know, what, why aren't people engaging in other fisheries? Why, why were they getting so upset and going on strike? Um, the reason was the American shad industry had been one of the most profitable fisheries for the Northeastern part of the state, um, but the stocks were dwindling. It was becoming overfished. Um, and also crabs were just destroying the gill nets at the time that were being used to catch these fish. And so a lot of fishermen were, had just been pivoting to the crab fishery. Also oysters had been incredibly profitable, but by the early 20th century, they too had become overfished. And there were also rising scares of typhoid fever had made oysters less popular, less profitable. But crabbing was sort of emerging as this new kind of hot fishery. Um, and so people saw potential there and that's why they're going into it. It was a very popular dish in Northern cities like Boston and New York. Um, and people were paying really good money for crabs, especially, you know, soft crabs and, and picked meat. Um, the Chesapeake Bay stocks were starting to dwindle at the time. And so there was more opportunities for North Carolinians to get in on the fishery and make money. Um, and also North Carolina kind of has, and as well as states south, um, of North Carolina have a, a sort of con can control the market very early on in the season um, because um, the Chesapeake Bay um, starts getting um, really active a little bit after North Carolina does. North Carolina starts getting active around like April, May is when a lot of money can be made. Um, the, the Bay Area, Chesapeake Bay doesn't really start firing off till uh, June. So the prices are, are higher early on in the season. Um, something that's important to note, there's been a lot of, I've talked about Maryland and Virginia a lot and in terms of dominating these, these crab houses and, and, the, and, and the industry and stuff. Virginia and Maryland controlled the prices um, in North Carolina for a, a very, very long time. Um, because most of the processors and buyers in North Carolina were based out of Norfolk and Hampton, Virginia or Crestfield, Maryland. Um, and they had the ability to dictate the prices um, of crab meat. And so now we've kind of gotten past, you know, the early 20th century. Now I just want to jump into crabbing and the Great Depression because it, it is an, becomes a more and more important industry at this time. Um, so during the Great Depression, uh, the commercial fishing industry in North Carolina was, was just tanking. It wasn't profitable at all, especially fin fish. However, crabs remained a profitable industry and it continued to, to be a growing industry in North Carolina. Um, for instance, soft shell crabs. 1929, um, the legislature decided to repeal the tax on crab meat which gave a leg up to crabbers. Um, in the early 1930s, the prices were still holding well um, for crab meat, particularly soft shell crabs. And in the sort of, these sort of biennium, these early bienniums of the Great Depression, the price of North Carolina crab meat went up, particularly for soft shell crabs. This is soft shell crab meat. It, it went up significantly. And as I mentioned earlier, that's because North Carolina has a monopoly on the early soft shell crab market because Virginia and Maryland are delayed getting into it um, until their waters get warmer. Also, you had 
several hurricanes struck the Chesapeake Bay in the early 1930s that heavily damaged Maryland's crab industry and really opened up more doors for North Carolinians to get in um, and make money. Um, and it was acknowledged, the, the, the crab industry, that the increased demand has meant a lot to our fishermen as supported their families during the whole spring and summer. Is crabbing and clamming really kept a lot of North Carolina commercial fishing families going during the Great Depression. Those two fisheries did. Those were the two most, those are two rather profitable fisheries. Also, you had more and more crab houses opening, particularly in Carter County, for instance, the Newburgh Seafood Company, which processed crabs, moved to Beaufort in 1934 and opened up more and more jobs. Then uh, the Gordon C. Willis Seafood Company uh, opened up in Moorhead City, again, opened more jobs. It was a state-of-the-art cannery at the time, used the, the top flight technology that was available. Also, is one of the most sanitary um, crab houses in North Carolina, is setting industry standards. Um, and so a lot was taking place. Now, despite all of this, um, despite all this growth, um, it was really hard to find people who are willing to pick crab meat because it is hard, tedious work. Um, and the, the pay can be, you know, okay if, if you're good at it, not so good if, if you're not fast. Um, in the 30s, there's also conservation laws were coming into play to protect North Carolina's crab industry. They banned dredging for crabs. Now, um, Using dredges to take crabs in North Carolina uh, was another method um, to take crabs, kind of like an oyster dredge. You scoop the crabs off the bottom. Um, but it was one of these methods that was, it was constantly being banned. Um, and then it'd come back for a little while and it get banned again. Um, so that's why I haven't talked about it too much. But also they banned the taking of sponge crabs or these female crabs that are getting ready or in the process of spawning. Also, by 1935, trawling for hard crabs takes over. It becomes, it becomes a big thing. So this is the same type of, uh, same or similar setup they have for taking shrimp in North Carolina, using otter trawls, but you're using them to take crabs. And um, in 1935, a trot line crabber could earn $15 a day with a trot line. Um, but in 1935, the handful of people who are trawling for crabs were making $65 a day. So big difference in terms of earnings. Um, however, by 1936, um, the state banned crab trawling um, and it put 300 crabbers primarily in Carter County, out of work. Um, and the reason they did it was over a territorial dispute in Core Sound. Um, you had fishermen on Harker's Island that did not like the, they didn't like the idea of crab trawling. So they started dumping engine blocks um, in the sound and other debris for people to snag their, their trawls on. Um, uh, and so the, the state temporarily banned trawling. Um, to sort of alleviate this dispute. However, they did bring trawling back um, like two years later. Um, you also had a crab cannery was established at Marshallburg. It was owned by Carol Crockett of Crisfield, Maryland again. Um, and he had long ties uh, to the Core Sound communities, um, but this meant an expansion of the hard sh um, shell crab industry in Core Sound, as well as other areas throughout North, um, Carteret County. And so um, towards the very end of the depression, you had a crabbing boom taking place in North Carolina where there's just, a, there's just rapid growth taking place. And it's becoming a more and more val valuable and more and more important fishery. And then um, 
and this is interesting. So at the beginning of the Great Depression, there's only four crab processing, processing plants active in North Carolina. Towards the end of the Depression era, there's 15. So it, as I said, it's a growing fishery. Then you have World War II hits, and it kind of places things on pause for a little while. Um, now, there, there were some positive outcomes for the fishery. Um, uh, imported crab meat, particularly from Japan, had been holding profits back within the industry. Um, up to World War II, uh, the United States had been uh, importing 11 million pounds of crab meat annually from Japan. And leading up to World War II, there had been pushes um, for tariffs on Japanese crab meat. There's also um, territorial disputes in Alaskan waters because the Japanese were allegedly going after um, American king crabs and interfering in that fishery. But with World War II, it brought an end to those imports, at least temporarily. There is also, at the kickoff World War II, a shortage of crabs in the Chesapeake Bay, which drove prices up. However, the crabbers, you know, all these men who are in the crabbing industry in North Carolina, a lot of them went off to war. Um, and so what was left behind were, were boys as young as nine years old, went into the fishery, sort of, sort of take their father's or brother's places. Um, and they kept the same hours um, as grown men. And they're going out from 4 a.m. to noon crabbing and selling their crabs to the local processors to support their families. Um, and the boys that didn't have to worry so much about supporting their families were taking their money and buying war bonds with them. Um, however, there's still a problem with having enough women to pick the crabs because during World War II, a lot of women found more gainful employment going to work for the federal government, or they went up, found that they could go off and work in war related industries due to sort of the the absence of men in those industries. So after World War II, you have a rapid expansion in the North Carolina blue crab fishery. Um, so there's 19 plants in 1950. 1952, the crab pot is finally introduced to North Carolina's waters. Now the crab pot had been around in the Chesapeake Bay since the 1930s but just wasn't being used in North Carolina. And it was originally introduced um, to, the, to Core Sound by a group of Virginians who got um, some local Carter County fishermen into using crab pots. And it took a little, it took a few years for the crab pot to take off in North Carolina. And it was primarily being used in sort of the Core Sound, Noose River area originally. But by 1955, crab pots were becoming really popular in North Carolina, um, and it caused immediate controversy um, because what was happening was people were placing crab pots out, and then people who were towing uh, shrimp trawls or crab trawls were getting hung up on the pots, and their nets were being torn, and they were getting upset, and then the, the crab potters were getting upset because their crab pots were getting messed up, and you just had two classes of fishermen who were at each other's throats. Now, there's also rumors that were floating around that these crab pots were actually not being set by North Carolinians, but by Virginians who were invading North Carolina's waters, and that there was um, supposedly a shooting war going on in North Carolina between Virginia and North Carolina crabbers, which was a complete fabrication. It wasn't the truth at all. However, the North at the time, what is now um, the, the Division of Marine Fisheries, the North Carolina Commercial Fisheries Division, they suspended the sale of commercial crabbing licenses to out-of-state fishermen to alleviate these tensions. But you also had the North Carolina Fisheries Association, Association call for the complete ban of crab pots in North Carolina waters. And um, however, uh, the state decided to table that discussion and just hope that it kind of fizzled out if they ignored it. 
Um, and so that's how they handled that situation. Um, 1858, there's another crabbing controversy, but this time it dealt with crab trawls and uh, trot lines, primarily in Pamlico, Sound, or Pamlico River and Pungo River. Um, so the trot liners at the time were campaigning to have the trawls banned. They claimed that the trawlers were overfishing and there wasn't enough crabs to go around for the trot liners. But the crab plants got involved in this controversy and they, they saved the trawls. They, they said the trot lines couldn't produce enough crabs to keep the plants in business and to keep people employed in picking crabs. Um, and that they needed the trawls to stay competitive. It would seem from the arguments put forth by the trot liners that the trot line might be losing its relevance. However, that was not the case. Um, the trot line did not go um, into decline until the late 1960s. In fact, the trot line peaked in 1953 in terms of crab landings with over eight 0.5 million pounds. Um, its second highest peak was actually in 1958 with over 7 million pounds. Um, and it didn't go into decline until 1967. Um, in fact, crab trawling didn't even begin to match trot line landings until 1964. Um, and um, what was really going on was crab pots were taking over. Crab pots were becoming the gear of preference for North Carolina crabbers. Oops. Um, now you had more controversy going into the 60s because North Carolina lifted the conservation laws that protected sponge crabs. And this drove the crabbers nuts because they, They'd seen what had been going on in Chesapeake Bay where states like Virginia had not been protecting sponge crabs in the past. And they saw problems with population decline. And they said, if we allow sponge crabs to be taken, then we're gonna wipe out our fishery. Um, but the state came back and said, well, the science doesn't prove or disprove that. So we're gonna let you take the sponge crabs. Um, so anyways, uh, then 1965, you have another huge controversy because the federal minimum wage was increased from $1.15 per hour to $1.25 per hour. And in response, the crab plants in North Carolina, um, they sort of, they protested uh, to both state and federal officials about this increase and how it was going to put them out of business. And so in protest, they shut their plants down temporarily. Um, all I think almost every single crab plant, except for one in Bellhaven, um, closed um, for about a month, or I think it was about a month to six weeks in protest. Of course, they had to institute this minimum wage, and, and they survived. Um, the 70s were, were kind of interesting for crabbing. Um, because in the late 60s and, and early 70s, you saw this rapid growth in the industry. And then um, around the mid 70s, you had this rapid decline. And it was like 75 was the lowest landings in 20 years. And people were freaking out and thinking that, you know, is there overfishing or is there pesticides? People were really worried about pesticides getting into the water supply and, and killing the crabs. Um, the, that there, people were freaking out. And then all of a sudden, 1978, you had record high landings. And then from 1978 to 1982, you had record landings every year consecutively for that period. And so people calmed down. Um, and then you saw explosive growth within the soft shell crab industry um, during the 1980s. Uh, the, the landings in 1977 were record low, um, then you, they shot up to record high in 1990. Um, and this was due to increased demand for soft shell crabs, which meant more money in the industry in the 80s. Um, also, the technology for soft shell crabs had really matured by the 1970s. Starting in the 1950s, people were experimenting with um, uh, closed system 
um, uh, shedding systems. So I had tanks of water on land that you could regulate. Um, you could regulate the pH, you could regulate the salinity, you could regulate the temperature, and you could make the conditions just right for your peeler crabs and your buster crabs, and you could decrease your mortality while you had them. And it just made for um, a more profitable industry. As I mentioned, that technology started to mature in the 70s. However, people didn't really know about what was going on in North Carolina. So you had Sea Grant um, had this massive education campaign and they set up demonstration soft shell crab operations and they put out tons of literature and they educated people on this technology and on these new methods and the industry just took off. Um, also, by the late 80s, you had transitions in labor within the crab industry um, that had huge impacts moving forward. So by the late 80s, um, a lot of the African-American women who had traditionally picked crabs in North Carolina were aging out. They were going into retirement and their children and grandchildren didn't want to step into their shoes. Uh, the younger generation just didn't want to pick crabs anymore because due to things like the civil rights movement, um, they had enhanced opportunities for education and employment in, in North Carolina. And uh, so there's other things that people could do. Um, during that time, uh, the crab houses started turning to hiring migrant workers from Mexico um, using a temporary work visa program called the H2B program, just for non-agricultural workers who are here for seasonal work in the United States for less than a year. Um, a lot of it has to do with like the mat pe the uh, meat packing industry and uh, crab houses fall within that. And the, um, so women, uh, Mexican women are primarily recruited. Uh, most of them that wound up in North Carolina were coming out of uh, the states of Sinaloa and Tabasco, because those states in Mexico have established um, uh, commercial fishing industries. And these women all had experience, most of them had experience in um, fish or crab processing houses. Um, and so they already had the skills that were required for the job. Um, and they were willing to, to work a job um, here in the United States that we couldn't get other people uh, to fill. And in order to get um, for these crab houses to actually use um, migrant workers, they have to prove to state and federal authorities that they cannot get enough workers domestically willing to work within those crab houses. But these Mexican women, they're here in the U.S. for seven to eight months. They're tied, they're supposed to legally, they're tied to one employer. Um, they're paid the U.S. minimum wage plus additional fees for each pound of crab meat that they pick. The rent and travel expenses, which are put up by the employers, are deducted from their paycheck, so they're, they're paying their employers back as they work. Um, but the migrant workers could make significantly more money than they could back in Mexico. And a lot of, it placed a lot of hardship on these women personally to be separated from their families and their children. But, and it also placed hardship on their families back home in Mexico. However, they're able to save up money and they, a lot of these women were putting their children through college. They're buying vehicles for their families back in Mexico. They're um, able to do additions, expand their homes, um, or they're also financing family businesses uh, back in Mexico with their earnings. Um, so in the eighties, and in the 90s, just it's a it's an expanding um, industry. Um, you had 20 by 1983, you had 25 crab process, processing plants, 7,200 boats, over 350,000 crab pots, um, and you had both full time and part time commercial fishermen on the water. Needless to say, things were getting crowded in North Carolina's waters. And tensions were flaring. You had the crab trawlers and the crab potters were at each other's throats, and you had the full-time 
fishermen and the part-time fishermen um, were at it. Um, and you also had the, these crab potters were also in conflict with the recreational boaters because the recreational boaters were claiming that the crab pots were uh, producing an impediment to navigation um, because the, the, but their boats were hitting pot, the pots or their props were being fouled in crab pots. Um, and so there's conflicts on the water. Um, and it became more heated as Virginian, as fishermen from Virginia and Maryland moved in. You also had fishermen coming from Louisiana, Texas, and California getting involved in North Carolina's crab industry. And a lot of this was due to a lack of regulation within the fishery as well as law enforcement. And so by 1993, North Carolina brought in a special license for crabbing where they required residency. So you had to be living in North Carolina for at least six months. They implemented it in 94, and immediately there was lawsuits um, in response that ultimately um, undermined the program, at least temporarily. You also had Mexican crowders um, in North Carolina waters, which you know irritated um, local fishermen. Um, and this was quickly um, ended because these uh, Mexican crabbers were being hired by crab processing plants under the H2B program, but they were working, you know, crab pots out in the water. And that was in violation of the federal regulations because the men were specifically hired to process seafood, not catch it. So that, that didn't last for too long. However, Conflict with Vietnamese immigrants was a, a real thing that has lasted for quite a while. Um, so you had Vietnamese crabbers in Terrell, Pasquotank, and Camden counties. And some of them were refugees that um, escaped Vietnam um, in the 70s and 80s um, on boats. Um, and then wound up crabbing in North Carolina. And the tensions really arose because, as I mentioned earlier, there's just too many fishermen and too many crab pots on the water. Um, also, the Vietnamese fishermen were willing to work longer hours um, for less pay. Um, and they were also willing to work more crab pots as well. Um, the, uh, th there are claims by commercial fishermen that North Carolina commercial fishing laws were being violated and also local customs and etiquette were being violated as well. For instance, there are claims that the crabbers were putting crab pots too close to gill nets or that they're putting crab pots too close to other crab pots. Um, so access uh, was, was, was being hindered. There were some armed confrontations on the Albemarle Sound um, in response. Um, fortunately, nobody was hurt but the Division of Marine Fisheries had to, conduct, had to conduct additional patrols to keep the peace. Um, and uh, people were arrested. Uh, some of the Vietnamese fishermen were arrested for obtaining North Carolina fishing licenses illegally um, because they didn't have full-time residency in North Carolina. Some of them split their time between here and Maryland. But also, local fishermen were also arrested because they did not have any licenses at all or they're using illegal gear. Um, but um, by the, the late 90s, early 2000s, you start to have a downward trend within the crab industry. Um, this is in part due to um, a decrease in population. Uh, production uh, decreased by 29% between 1999 and 2000. You had some big hurricanes that came through North Carolina at this time that dumped a lot of fresh water and pollutants into our sounds. Um, but more significantly, you had rising at, um, imported crab meat from Asia. Uh, so in 1994, 9 million pounds of imported crab meat. By 1999, you have 27 million. So it's tripled within five years. Um, also US employment in crab processing declined by 26% in those five years. Um, as I mentioned, most of these imports are coming out of Asia. And for instance, in Indonesia, they're paying people, they were paying people to pick crabs 
for four to five dollars per day. Um, so hardly livable wages. The crab processors petitioned the federal government. They petitioned the US International Trade Commission to place restrictions on imported crab meat. It failed because the Coalition for the Free Trade of Crab Meat had um, put in a counter petition uh, to keep the, the imports flowing. Um, there's a lot of US, big US um, food importers and distributors were involved. Um, then going into the 2000s, you had an unfavorable economy. Uh, so prior to 9-11, the seafood industry was, in North Carolina wasn't going strong. Then 9-11 happened and there's an economic chilling that went through uh, the seafood industry. Uh, prices and demand fell. Meanwhile, fuel prices were on the rise and they were eating into uh, the profits for crabbers. Uh, you had continued imports. By 2005, you had $293 million in imported crab meat coming into the United States. And our domestic blue crab fishery shrank by 25% in the first five years of the 2000s. Um, and so for the past, I'm kind of just fast forwarding, but the past 20 years, the challenges facing this industry in North Carolina have been reduced landings with rising foreign imports, um, rising costs of doing business. So things like fuel, um, fewer active crabbers out in the water, um, fewer crab pickers. And in fact, actually there's been a rising uh, trade in live crabs being shipped, um, fewer crab houses, um, hurricanes, for instance, Hurricane Florence did a tremendous amount of damage to the infrastructure for the North Carolina uh, crab industry. Uh, pollution and habitat loss um, in our local waters are also threatening crab populations. And uh, by, night, by, by 2020, Division Marine Fisheries had declared that the North Carolina blue crab was overfished. Um, however, Blue crabs and shrimp are North Carolina's two most viable fisheries. Um, I think currently blue crabs are number two. Um, but since 2020, there have been new management programs that have been implemented. So for instance, closed seasons, sanctuary areas for spawning crabs, size limits on females, um, no possession of immature crabs, and um, aims to reduce bycatch um, of crabs. Um, so this is kind of what the state's currently trying to do to, to get that fishery back up. But, uh-oh, well, this is weird. For some reason, the computer is being weird and it's not showing uh, what's going on on my y-axis and blocked out part of my x-axis. But this is the soft shell crab production and value in North Carolina. Um, and as you can see, it's is strong early in the 20th century, then it petered off, then it exploded in the 80s, and the values have stayed high ever since. Okay, this is working out for hard crabs. And this is the growth that we've had in our uh, crab industry, and then the decline in the late 90s and 2000s. However, Price is staying strong. Um, so let that kind of so I can, and that's basically what I've got for y'all for my presentation. Um, do y'all have any questions or thoughts? Yes, ma'am. Can you explain to me what soft shell crabs are? Is that blue it, crab be blue shell at time? Yes, ma'am. So the how do we harvest them? Um, so, oops. So the question is, um, was about soft shell crabs and how they harvest them and whatnot. So here, let me just, I'll show you. 
So earlier I was talking about the molting. So, so, so the soft shell crab is simply a blue crab that's completely molted. And so um, they know that it's getting ready to molt based on um, some signs, um, coloration on the shell. As mentioned, you have these white line, pink and red, which will kind of give an indication of how close they are to shedding. And so they'll get these crabs, preferably when they're farther along in their, their process of getting ready to separate from their shell. So like your pink or your red line, have them in a tank and then they'll monitor them. And, and it's like a 24 hour a day, people working in shifts. It's incredibly time consuming, labor intensive. That's why it's expensive. Well, they, 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 get the, they get the crabs out of the sounds, the rivers and sounds, um, and they, they can put them in the tanks. Mm -hmm. Right. And so then um, when they're, they're molting, then they can shift them, or when they're, they're soft, they can shift them to another tank along, um, to be a, a kind of recuperate, and then they can take them out. Um, and I think it takes a couple hours for them to recuperate after shedding, and then they can they can start packing them away. Yes. I know in Maryland they do some kind of a challenge every year, not harvested crabs, but basically where they grow and live, mm -hmm. and they can tell that the number of are increasing or decreasing, and then it's pretty clear. Do they do that in their village? Yeah, yeah, so the, the, the question for the people online is how does the state monitor the crab populations apart from landings? And um, the state will kind of do these, um, they'll go out and do samplings. They'll go out and, and sweep the sounds, collect them, count them. They'll, they'll uh, and like one of the things that, that they, they keep track of is um, spawning populations. Um, you know, see how many um, crabs are currently spawning. And that's one of the ways they keep track of um, the, the population and, and forecasting few future populations, you know, how many female spawning females they find. Um, but yeah, they, they, they use different sort of methods like that where they're going out and what they, same thing they do in Maryland, basically. Yes, sir. Are you aware of what the fellows of the Thomas Seafood are doing? No, I'm, 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 they, I'm not. They're, they uh, teamed up with SUNC and a couple other organizations and are successfully growing, not obviously not salt crabs, but they mm -hmm. are from, from, from embryos. Yeah. The whole way through to, uh, you know, uh, and as the people online, there's just a gentleman pointing out that one of the local seafood processors is taking the crabs from embryo stage all the way to mature for harvesting. And that method has been around since the 1950s that you just described. We're for taking an egg and sperm, fertilizing, creating an embryo and growing a crab to maturity. That technique was first pioneered in the 1950s by Doctor, gosh, I forget his name, but he's here in Beaufort. Yeah, is is over at um, Pyrus Island where they first did it. The way it was presented, though, is that, like this is. Yeah, I mean, this is the it's the first that does what counts to do it. Um, I don't know because uh, I think people they they initially did it here on Pyrus Island in the fifties. Um, and it was earth shattering at the time. And there was all this talk back in the 50s that, hey, this is going to be the future. Um, but then it, it just, no one, I guess maybe the technology at the time was holding them back from expanding it. But it sounds like the technology is available now where they can really grow this into being a, a big yeah, I industry. Exactly where it was. But I just dropped in on them today and they were mm -hmm. very kind in the for the whole place, and they yeah. have five outdoor ponds that they put, they allow the crab to grow to size, mm -hmm. and then the way they harvested, kind of like a trot line, except they put branches of uh, cream rose mm -hmm. hanging suspended in the water, and then the crabs would find shelter, and then they walk that line just the same way you would a trot line, 
and then uh, when you're big enough to move into the tanks, it's pretty special. Yeah, that's, that, that's really cool. It's, you know, who knows? Farming might be the yeah. future. Um, oh, I have another question. What happened to the trot line? It, it just kind of, um, the people still used them for a while, um, but people were finding it was easier to use crab pots, I think. I mean, if you just track the, the landings by equipment, it, you know, people continued to use the trot line, but I, but the, the, the crab pots um, and crab trawls ex wound up exceeding them. I so I don't know, people just kind of quit talking about them. Yeah, I'm, I'm American. Mm -hmm. uh, But I think it's a DNR thing too. I don't think it's legal uh, here. It's certainly not. In, correct, correct. Yeah. Up to, I, up to 100 feet. And then what's the point? Yeah, I think they are legal, but it's, you're right. The, the trot lines are very, sh have very short limits on them. As you mentioned, like, what's the point if it's just it's a short line? Yeah. Like you need like a thousand yeah. foot line or something to make it worth your while. But twelve hundred feet in any configuration. So right. I would run two six hundred foot lines, you know, a certain distance apart. So when I ran that one, that one I dressed long enough to go and stun out when I threw the that one and then right. stun <laughs> So we have any other questions or questions from online? No? Okay. Well, if that's it, thank you all. I really appreciate everyone online and everyone, um, yeah.